Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we are doing two recipes and then both crumbed cauliflower recipes. Uh, so this is something you can do to substitute out of generally chicken. So we're going to be doing cauliflower for Japanese curry, like a cauliflower katsu and a chicken, oh I mean cauliflower parmesan. So yeah, let's get started with the first recipe which is the cauliflower katsu. Okay everyone, we are going to get started with first recipe involving cauliflower and that is going to be cauliflower katsukare or yeah cauliflower katsu well what should I say is crumbed cauliflower in a uh, Japanese curry style so to start off simply grab your cauliflower and we are just going to create a you know a s kind of a steak from this cauliflower Okay, well, we're gonna try and, and get an actual stay. <laughs> it's actually holding together. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's gonna hold together very well. There we go. That cut will. Now we just cut that off. Unfortunately, it gets a bit like that. The floats don't stick together, so you can't make a very nice, uh, yeah, nice steak, as they call it. And we'll just cut off these little bits here. That will do okay. That will do okay. Okay, and what we're gonna do is let it soak. So then we also have this little container, which we're gonna be soaking this in. A cup of milk or non-dairy milk or whatever. I've just made some cashew milk. So we use a cup of that. And then we want a tablespoon of rice vinegar. So this is about a third of a tablespoon. So we'll just do through. Then we just want to some season it with some ground pepper, some white pepper, and some garlic powder. And if you have onion powder as well, you can add some onion powder. So just a teaspoon of those two, and another teaspoon of some, some salt. Let's do this. Let's mix these together. So the vinegar is gonna just make it curdle a little bit of the milk. And I think soften it up. I don't actually know why we do it like this. I think it's to soften it up the cauliflower a little bit for the crumbing and all that and then we just gently place in the mixture and get that nice and submerged and try not to break too much of it and we just leave that to soak for 45 minutes easy peasy and then we'll move on to actually making the Japanese curry and this is just super simple so I'll just kind of fly through the next part so yeah we are going to be making a simple Japanese curry using just this SMB classic curry mix or curry roux. I've got the hot one this time. And we're literally just supposed to be following the instructions on the packet. It, I've done this a few times and it just worked really well. So we're just gonna be peeling potatoes, sweet potato, and using half an onion, which I have here, and half an onion. Half an onion. Peeling, and it's pretty simple really. And just dice it up. And they don't have to be too small, like you're going to be wanting to eat these. So you can be as chunky as you like or as small as you like, but yeah, you don't have to be too, too worried. Try and keep them, obviously try and keep them as, as equal as possible. Now we do a sweet potato, just peel a bit off. I think we're going to be using maybe half of this. Try and keep them equal amounts. Choppity choppity. Choppity, choppity. All right, so got a little bit of, uh, got my potatoes and sweet potatoes. And now we just do half an onion. You can do a whole onion, but I need to use half an onion for the other cauliflower recipe, which we're gonna be doing. The beauty with the onion in this dish is you don't have to finely chop it. Cause we are making slithers, woo. And as always, you wanna try and make them as even as possible if you can, but it's no biggie. No biggie at all. You can add whatever you want. A lot of people, a lot of times you use carrot. I don't really like carrot in um, curries. I prefer sweet potato and potatoes and like lentils and stuff. But there you go. That's, that's all we need. And what we're gonna do now is just literally just add it to the pot. Well, this is what the instructions say. Simmer it, add a pot, stir fry it for about five minutes, then cover it with water 
cook for about 15 to 20 minutes, or I guess until it's uh, it's cooked, and then you put the roux in. And we'll, I'll show you the kind of steps, but that's literally it. That's literally what it says on the packet. That is what I'm doing. There's not much else I have to really say there. There we have it basically just cooking, like I said. Yeah, it's just very simple. I'm just following the packet instructions because it tastes well and works. So we'll just do that. After it's, you know, been cooking and stir frying for about five, there's a little bit of softness to it. Just cover it with water. And then just mix every now and again. Let it cook for about 15 minutes or so. Yeah, just cook it until the sweet potatoes and potatoes are cooked. And then when it's cooked, just turn off the heat, add in the roux and just mix together until it's curry and that's it. That's it for the curry bit. And there's the finished product of the Japanese curry. Yeah, I've put it, I've turned off the heat, I've just mixed in the roux and I'm just gonna leave that with the lid on and it's ready to serve basically. Okay, so we've done our curry. We've cooked some rice as well. So while you're waiting for the cauliflower to, I don't know, be in the brine, I think the brine, yeah, be in the brine, uh, you just let it, you do your curry, you cook some rice. And the next step is breading. So we'll just bring out our cauliflower. Here we go, there we go, it's been in the brine. And let's make our kind of breading station, shall we? Okay. So we are gonna have flour. I'm gonna add a cup, a cup of flour. I'm just gonna pour an amount in. And if we need more, we'll need more. Since we're only doing one steak, and then a little bit of baking powder. So for one cup, you do one cup flour and teaspoon of this. I'm just gonna add a little. We don't need measurements. Just give that a bit of a mix around. And if you have cornstarch as well, add some cornstarch in there. I do not, and I'm pretty sure last time I did this, I didn't need it. And then this last one over here, we are gonna add panko breadcrumbs. Some lovely panko breadcrumbs, cause panko rule supreme. And now, we are gonna do a double dredging sort of thing. So this is the wet dredge, dry dredge, and then the breadcrumbs. This from here, and we are going to cover this with as much flour possible. Then we're gonna put it back in there and we're gonna do that a couple of times. Getting all the crevices and then you kinda of wanna gently shake off, shake off any excess flour. Like so then we're gonna add it back into wet dredge. Now if you have a better bowl, you can probably actually cover it a bit nicer. And then back in the dry, make sure it's all covered as much as possible. You know, keep trying to make it all you know, get it nice covered. You might think, oh, we we'll only do it once, but it does actually, I think, make quite a difference if you do it twice. It just adds that kind of nice battering on the outside sort of thing. And then we'll add it to the wet dredge for the last time. And then this is when we add it to the panko crumbs for the last bit. Just grab your fork and you just want to get it pankoed everywhere, basically. Pankoed on top. I do find when you do, whenever you bread something, it's always a little bit of wastage. Can't make use of literally everything, which is kind of unfortunate, but now because I haven't done this a lot of time, I don't know the most efficient technique for this. I do know that it is, it goes so well. We've done a lot. I'm just going to leave that there for now. And now we're going to set up a wok and heat up some oil and a, a tray. Pour in our oil. This is oil I've used before. You can see from all the gunk at the bottom. Should be enough. So if you have a deep fryer or if you have a crock pot, is that I have a wok, so that is what I am using. And now we heat up the oil. So I don't think there's enough, there's gonna be enough oil for it to be fully covered. I think that's okay, that's fine. And I have chopsticks. <laughs> Because we're doing the chopstick and the oil method to see how it's cooking. You can see this one that I've actually, I'm pretty sure I used for the picaronis. So now we just wait for it to warm up. Okay, so the oil, so it's it's bubbling. There's bubbles coming off from the, the wood, which means it's time to put in look at that go. And then we just cook it until it's golden brown. I like it just before it starts to get that 
really really dark brown or as it goes kind of like it goes really dark brown so really golden that's how I like it and I'll probably put a bit on the other side this side a little bit a little bit more that's okay I think half the problem is it's not deep enough as well because I don't have enough oil that's okay we'll just kind of flip in between try and keep it gentle so we keep the breading intact and we'll just we'll just do that oh look at that that is what we are looking for. Oh man, bit of a bit of a danger with the focus. All right, that is good. Let's just turn it off. Let's transfer to the tray here. Look at that. That looks good. You can't tell me that does that does not look so good. All right, look at that. Look at that. That's kind of cool. Whoa. There's we just cut it. That is, I mean, you can almost can't even tell that it's cauliflower, almost. And that's like a simple Japanese curry. Let's give it a taste test, shall we? Look at that. <laughs> Japanese curry, let's get it. Look at that. Nice serving of a... Uh... Mm. So good. I really, for some reason the Japanese curry turned a lot, a lot more liquidy than I'm used to. That's okay. But I do like the Japanese curry with some sort of katsu chicken or katsu curry cauliflower. Just for that oiliness and that kind of crunchiness adds to it. Because I find that with just the curry by itself, it's a bit unbalanced in like acidic way, I think. So I just need the oiliness to kind of, the fattiness of that to kind of bring it down a little bit, I think. But yeah, super good. First recipe. And we'll go with another one as well. 10 out of 10. Highly recommend doing this if you have a wok or you have a way to deep fry. And uh, yeah, I want to eat some cauliflower. I'll sign love cauliflower a lot more now. <laughs> All right, it is time to do the second recipe and we are going to be doing another cauliflower and we're going to be trying to make cauliflower parmigiana. Uh, so this will be interesting. We're going to do a similar start as we did with the katsu cauliflower or the crumb cauliflower. We're going to crumb it a similar way. We're going to put a steak and we're going to put in the vinegar and all the cashew milk and uh, leave it to brine for 45 minutes before then crumbing it in a very, in a basically the same style as that. But we're going to do it in a parmigiana style. We're going to pan fry it instead of deep frying it this time. So with that being said, We'll start with the brine. Why well, should we got to start with the cauliflower? We need the cauliflower. So let's make another steak. All right, now I'll sharpen my knife, so hopefully it's a bit nice. Make it nice and thick. Can't go wrong with that. Just see how it will fit in. Can we fit in? Not quite. We need to just maybe get rid of that. There we go, perfect. Well, basically perfect. Now we've got our jar of cashew milk. Now we we'll just grab a cup of this vinegar. I actually have a tablespoon this time. And I actually don't remember what it was for this, so we'll just, whoa. Oh, well, it's gonna be, it's gonna be peppery. <laughs> oh, well, oh, you can't see, you didn't see. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, so I accidentally put way too much ground white pepper. That's okay, let's not stress out too much. Brian, and we'll just, and we'll just let that sit for 45 minutes in there. Just leave that in the fridge. Okay, so that's that bit done. And what's that? What's that else we have to do for parmigiana? That's right. We've got to make the tomato sauce. So that's what we're going to be doing next. We're going to be making the kind of saucy mixture that goes on top. And we have some shredded cheese, which I'm lactose-free cheese, which I'm going to use. But you can use any sort of cheese you want, or a variety of cheeses is always good, like some mozzarella, parmesan, just some standard tasty is a good mixture. But uh, yeah, let's just clean up a little bit and then we'll start making the tomato. To make this sauce, super simple. Uh, we are first gonna be, actually we'll first make up, crush up some garlic. So the recipe that I'm using says, crush up two large cloves of garlic. So I'll just use three of these. I'll just try and use some of these, these ones. Ugh. You know what, I'm gonna try an idea of using so I've crushed the garlic right using the crusher. It's not the best. And then we just, with the remainder bits, we just finally chop it. Cause they're nice and flat already. That's such a sick idea. Why have I never done this before? All right, that's the garlic done. And uh, now we will do the onion. Finely chopped half onion. Okay, so we've got our finely cut onions finely cut onions and some garlic. So now we move on to actually the cooking stage. So let's change the view. 
All right, back to this view. You know, you've seen this view a few times now. Add a splash of olive oil. No, not olive oil. Vegetable oil, just cooking oil, something neutral. Let's add in our garlic and our onion. So you want these to be softened. Yeah, and then we just kind of soften this up a little bit. Okay, when the onions have softened, which they are about now, we are going to add in some canned diced tomatoes, 400 grams, which is just a standard tin size. Boom, just like that. Get in all of that sauce. And then add in some like dry basil or I'm using Italian herbs, about a tablespoon. I'm just gonna chuck in the rest of whatever's in here just to give a bit of extra flavor. Also, we are gonna add in one and a half tablespoons of brown sugar. I don't have any of that, so we're just gonna use some raw sugar. Brown sugar will probably give it a bit nice uh, flavor. This is just to probably cut down uh, the acidity of the tomato. Because yeah, parmigiana sauce often has a little bit of sweetness to it. Then you just make, get that up to a uh, to bubbling. It should be pretty, pretty close to it. Okay, so it's bubbling. And now we just turn it down to a simmer. And you just kind of keep it simmering for, until you get to a con desired consistency. Uh, if you're doing parmigiana with chicken, then I'd say just, you just keep on simmering until you need to use it. And that's what I'm gonna do here. It says about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. The recipe, you just do it to whatever consistency you want. So I'm just gonna keep this simmering until we uh, finish crumbing our cauliflower. And also if you don't want it to be in a, a chunky mixture like this, you can go ahead and grab like a stick mixer or chuck this into a blender and get it nice and smooth if you prefer a smooth consistency. If you're like me and you don't care about the consistency and you don't really wanna do another, wash another dish then you just leave it in this chunky form so it just depends up to you what kind of texture you are after okay it's time to crumb the cauliflower so very simply the same way we did yesterday that this one's going to be for the panko of course this one's going to be for the flour and then we're going to use the brine flour brine no brine so it's in the brine then we go flour then brine then flour again and then brine again and then panko and that's the plan so let's do it. I'd say that's pretty well covered in as much breadcrumbs as I can do. We'll take, and this is what our kind of parmesan sauce, I think I got a little bit of burnt bits at the bottom. So that's kind of interesting, but oh well. So yeah, we'll just get that off, off the heat so we can move our camera and show the frying of the cauliflower. We've got to go on, chuck a, a nice amount of oil in there. You know, a nice amount. Just get that heating up. All right, that should be warm enough. And then we just... All right, maybe not warm enough. That's okay. And we just let that kind of cook. Now, this is the first time I've done it using this bit. Uh, I obviously thought there's going to be a much more sizzle going on at this moment, but I guess I was just a little bit too premature. But that's okay. We need. It's kind of thick, so we kind of want it to cook. Let's see what it's looking like underneath. Yeah, it's still a little while to go. Oh yes, now's a good time to flip. Oh. Look at that. That looks pretty good. That's what you want to see. That is what you want to see right there. That's the kind of coloring you want. You could probably go slightly darker, but we're getting on the edge a bit. You know, just before it starts going like dark, 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 about almost burnt. And that's what I was about after about maybe six, seven minutes. You just, when you're cooking, you just gotta keep focus, be in the moment, don't get distracted. Otherwise you'll burn things, you'll overcook things. That's just my advice. You know, that looks pretty good after the flip. So I think we are good to turn off now. It's had a nice caramelization. Obviously the sides, not so much, but hopefully in the oven, that will be nice and cooked anyway. So let's just turn that off. Let's bring it across. There is our nice cauliflower. We want to add our tomato to the top of it. Get that nice covered. And you're probably going to be left over with a bunch unless you do like a lot. So if you're doing this for chicken, you just get a bunch of breast chickens and you just kind of stick them together and just lay it on top. But I'm sure you can use this for a lot of other things like a, it's a general purpose tomato sauce you can use for pasta. You can probably use it as a chunky pizza sauce. You know, just be creative. That's what I'm going to have to do. Now, if you want to get the best, best grated cheese, always use 
block cheese and don't use like I'm doing already pre-shredded cheese because there's there's things that stop it from clumping together in the packet but I don't have a cheese grater I should invest in a cheese grater so I can grate my own cheese and then you just place the cheese on top you know as much cheese as you want I love cheese even though even this lactose free cheese still gets to me you know a nice thick amount like that and then let's chuck this into the oven and there it is so yeah, and now the aim of the oven is to just kind of cook down the cheese and get that nice and brown. And it's also going to add a little bit more extra cooking to the cauliflower, which is what we want because the sides aren't very cooked. And I'm not sure how the insides are. First time doing it because it was a very thick piece. If you're doing this with chicken, you on the pan frying, you just want to kind of probably turn up the heat a little bit more and get it browned a lot quicker so that when you chuck in the oven it's still a little bit of rare in the middle so it will kind of cook through and it won't get fully dry in the oven and I'm sure a lot bit of practice is involved but you get there pretty quickly so yeah next time we see is when you will bring it out oh look at that look at that I don't know if it's in focus but look at that whoa that just looks phenomenal that's what you want to be looking for when you uh, take out I'm trying it's nice golden brown melty goodness of the cheese taste testing going shall we check that out I am so happy with how this all right so now <laughs> this is the fun part I've actually been to eat now I would have often have like a salad with a parmesan but I guess we are eating vegetables as well we have tomato and cauliflower so Mmm, hot. Really hot. Mmm, <laughs> it's quite good. Just get a bit more cheesiness. So you don't have to worry, the cauliflower is fully cooked, at least on the edge. We have to see when we get closer in, but ooh, this hits the spot, man. Hmm, so what I have to say, I say it is, it is great. It is actually amazing. I think I probably should have added a bit more salt to the sauce. I reckon, I reckon I needed, I didn't really taste test the sauce like I should have. Maybe some salt and pepper with tomato sauce, maybe a little bit more. The cauliflower is nicely cooked. It's a very different Parmigiana than you'd expect from like a chicken, uh, crumb chicken. Like it's not exactly like, it's like almost like a, you kind of think of it like a schnitzel with some sauce and cheese on top. This is to like totally different. It's obviously because of the cauliflower, but it is amazing. It's wonderful. This is, <laughs> First time I've tried this and it worked very well. Outside breading has been kind of dried out a little bit, but it's still, it's moist, it's very moist. I'd say it is very good. <laughs> oh man, I love when recipes come together and actually work well. Had a good feeling about this because it worked really well with the, the curry. I have a feeling the deep friedness is, works really well with the curry, so it's not as good as the curry, but oh. If you ever want a, a vegetarian parmigiana, try this out, try this out. I'm gonna enjoy this. Yeah, because I'm starving. I'm so hungry, man. So hungry. So there we have two recipes of cauliflower that you can use for substituting for chicken. Or just try it out yourself. Like, you don't necessarily, and in case you don't do it and you want to try it out, both very excellent and both turned out super well. So yeah, thank you all for watching and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week for next week's video. And don't forget to subscribe and do all that jazz. You know, help me out a bit. Would be great. Peace.